morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Thanks to our new sound system. It's great to see you all this morning. I want to welcome you to our second series in the eight-week lecture series, this one on world religions. I recognize many of your faces either from our church or from previously attending the lecture series, and it's great to have you back again. I especially want to welcome you to our new church building. Uh, there's still a lot to be done on it, but what do you think so far? So this eight-week series is on world religions, and let me start with an explanation, and uh, I, perhaps I should say a bit of a confession uh, to get us started on this series topic. Um, we obviously are meeting in a Christian church, and I am a Christian. In fact, you might even say I'm a professional Christian because I am the minister of Lakeside Presbyterian Church. And so I've had several people sort of question, well, why are you doing a series here in the church on world religions? Well, there are several reasons. One is because in my own sort of academic career, I developed something of a concentration on the area of world religions, or what's sometimes called comparative religion, um, to the extent that uh, Windstar Cruises has invited me in three times in the past, and they say they want to again in the future, they haven't yet, to lecture on their cruises in the Eastern Mediterranean and in the Middle East. The Middle East, of course, being the site where a number of the world religions were started, including especially the three great monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So I've spent a lot of my academic focus on studying world religions, comparative religions, and for me, as a Christian, it is very important for me to understand, I, I don't feel like I can legitimately, reasonably, intellectually, positively describe to people why I believe in the Christian faith unless I know what other faiths believe and why I feel, myself, that Christianity is, is correct in a way that some other religions are not. Um, and so I think we need to know, wherever you're coming from, I think all of us need to have some understanding of what the other faith systems are that exist in the world. And a very common thing today, uh, a lot of people would say, well, all religions are equally true in some way. Well, for very specific philosophical reasons, I don't actually believe that. And I will get into that as we go along a little bit in the course of our talks. But I believe each of us has to decide where we're going to plant our flag, where it is that we are going to live in terms of our own faith. And in order to do that reasonably, I think we need to know what other religions maintain. We need to know what we don't believe, I think, almost as much as what we do believe. And so we are going to be looking over the next eight weeks at world religions. Now, um, I... I hope you will believe me when I say I will be even-handed about this and fair. A number of you, as I say, I know were in my earlier series of lectures. And hopefully you would attest to the fact that when I talked about Judaism or Islam, for instance, I was even-handed about it. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. yes. And so even though I'm coming from a particular faith perspective, I will give you a fair representation of what other religions believe. So what exactly are we going to be talking about? Let's look at the schedule. Um, Today we're doing an introduction, which I've called a universal human experience. We're going to be looking at what religion is, and you might be surprised to hear that there are a lot of disagreements about exactly what religion is and how we should define that word, why religious beliefs exist, and why it is that every human culture that we really know anything about down through history has had some sort of religious belief, depending upon how you define religion. And again, there's some question about that. Some people would argue with that statement that all cultures have had religious beliefs, but that's because they may disagree about what religion is. So today we're going to be talking about religion and the, the prevalence of religious belief systems amongst human beings and why that might be. Then, next week, we're going to actually start talking about the specific religions. Next week, uh, the 28th of August, we're going to start out with uh, a chronological order of the world's religions. And I'm going to give you a definition of world religion a little bit later. But the first religion we will talk about is the one that is, um, by most people's expectation, welcome back, Hansons. <laughs> they just got back from overseas. So, um, so the first religion we will talk about is Hinduism, the, the religion of India. And so we will get into what Hinduism is about. The second week, we will talk about the second oldest religion, or the, uh, the third week, actually, the second week we're dealing with the specific religions. That is Judaism. Judaism is believed to be the second oldest extant religion. And you might hear me use the word extant. If you don't know that, it's a chance to learn a new word. Extant means still existing today from ancient times. So we're talking here about religions that are still being practiced. 
If you attended my earlier lectures, you heard some of my lectures on ancient religious beliefs of Mesopotamia and Egypt and the Roman and Greek pantheon of gods. We're not going to get into those that are no longer in existence. We're talking about extant, that is still existing and still practiced religions. So we will talk about Judaism. Even though Judaism only has 14 million adherents in the whole world, to give you some perspective, there are twice as many Sikhs, people who, who accept the Sikh religion, there are twice as many Sikhs as there are Jews in the world. In fact, there are more Southern Baptists in the United States than there are Jews in the world. And yet, Judaism and the Jewish people have done perhaps more to contribute to global culture and history than any other people. And so they absolutely deserve their own, their own week, even though there are only 14 million Jews in existence. On September 11th, we will be looking at the religions that began in India. Now, technically, we could include Hinduism in this, but Hinduism being the oldest of the extant religions and one that's very complicated and one that we usually, most of you probably don't know very much about, and Hinduism will get its own week. But on September 11th, we will talk about the other religions that began in India, especially Buddhism, and as you will see from the list here, Sikhism and Jainism. Buddhism is the fourth largest religion. And we will talk about that even though there is a very real argument to be made that Buddhism is not actually a religion. And you'll find out why when you come on September 11th. <laughs> on September 18th, we will be looking at the religions of China and Japan. Um, this is usually, these are usually called the Far Eastern religions, but from our perspective, Far Eastern could be anything the other side of San Juan Tacomatlan. So, <laughs> so I have chosen to refer to them as the religions of China and Japan, and particularly Taoism, Confucianism, Shinto, which you may not be familiar with, but it is the national religion of Japan, and then some others. You'll notice in a couple of these I've got it separate. I will mention some of the other smaller belief systems within those categories, but we'll not go into a lot of detail. On September 25th, we will be looking at Christianity. And even though you may have been a churchgoer your whole life, uh, I recommend you be here because there might be some things you can still learn, all right? On October 2nd, the one people are always interested in is Islam. I have done the talk on Islam previously, an introduction to Islam, and I confess to you who came previously that a lot of the content I will do there uh, will be the same, or at least very similar. And the reason is because Islam has not fundamentally changed in less than a year. And so we will deal with the history, the basic beliefs, and I will get into some of the radical militant Islamism, which is the term that's used for ISIS and Al-Qaeda and some of the others, Islamism. And we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Then on October 9th, which is my birthday and my wife's birthday, we were born on the same day, about eight hours apart. Um, October 9th, and we will talk about sort of a mashup of animism, which some people would argue is the oldest religious idea in the world, although it is not a religion in terms of any sort of organized belief system. We then will jump to the other end of the chronological spectrum, and we'll talk about the, the New Age, the New Age movement, which is not really all that new. It's actually a rebirth of ancient Gnostic ideas. We will talk about atheism, including the new atheism, the Daniel Dennett's and uh, others of the world and also secularism. Uh, one of the phenomena of the last 50 years or so is a significant increase in the number of people. They're called the nuns, not N-U-N-S, N-O-N-E-S, because when they fill out a form, a survey, and they ask you what your religious belief is, they give all these options, one of the boxes is none. And so more people have been checking the none box, or, and some will identify themselves or will confess to be a convinced atheist, and we'll talk about that, all right? Now, one of the things in this, I know we're in a bigger setting than we were before, and I, I, I'm high and lifted up, but only because that way everybody can see me better. But if you have any questions as we go along, please raise your hand or yell at me or throw your shoe or do whatever you have to, because I do want to answer your questions. And sometimes questions need to be answered right then. Now, if it's too complicated, that I, you know, we'd be going down a trail that we can't get back from in the hour we have allotted to us, or if, if I don't know the answer, and I will always confess to not know if I don't know the answer, but if I don't know and need to do some homework, I'll do that. I may ask you to come up to me afterwards, or I may take the question and address it at the start of the next week, but in every case that I can, I will try to answer your question, so please feel free to ask. Um, I certainly don't know everything about this topic, but I've studied as, as much as I can, and so I will do everything I can to try to answer your questions. And so, are there any questions about the schedule or anything that we are going to be doing? 
couple of very practical matters. The bathrooms are out this door, and if you turn right down the hallway, you'll see the men's and women's bathrooms on the right. Or if you go out this door and turn left over by the kitchen, there's two handicapped bathrooms, but they're available for use by anyone. Right outside this door, as you notice coming in, there is coffee, there are cookies. Feel free to get a cup of coffee anytime you want, and after the talk, please stick around, get a cup of coffee, a, a cookie, talk. I'll be around, others will be around. We'd love to have you spend a little time getting to know each other and sharing your experience today, all right? So, if there are no questions, yes, Carrie? Are you gonna put this on the website like you did last time? The reason for the camera is because this is being recorded. It will be on the website. I will let you all know as we go along. We have two websites. One is for our church, which is LPC, Lakeside Presbyterian Church, lpcchapala.org. We also have a theological institute here, a theological school where we offer, I'm just getting ready to do the ninth term, the last three of a 27 course um, curriculum. And that has its own website, LIT, Lakeside Institute of Theology, litchapala.org. The past lectures that I have done are all on there now. If you go on the website and you see across the bar, um, the main bar at the top, it says Winstar Talks. There's several different tabs underneath that, which are talks that I've done, and actually also talks that uh, a friend of ours, an Egyptologist, she's a real honest to goodness Egyptologist who was with us on one of the cruises we did, um, and uh, Emily, and there are talks on there from Emily as well, if you're interested in Egyptology. So all of those are there. We will put these videos of these lectures on as well. So that will be available. Some of you have already told me that you, you'll be here the, for the first one. You can't be here for all of them, etc. But you will be able to watch them. It's free of charge. You can access them anytime you want on the internet. Okay? Any other questions? Which website? LITchapala.org. It's on the LIT Chapala that we have those. If you want to hear my sermons, you can go to LPCchapala.org. But that's different. Okay? So let's ask the question, what is religion? As I said, there is some considerable disagreement between scholars about what religion really is or how we ought to define that word. Depending upon whether you talk to anthropologists, historians, sociologists, linguists, people who deal with the meanings of words or others, they disagree about defining what constitutes a religion. Now the typical dictionary definition would be something like a belief in or the worship of a god or gods, right? Sounds simple. But get sociologists into it, or linguists, people who deal with the specific meanings of words or history, um, and it gets different. The idea of religion being the service or worship of God or of the supernatural gets more complicated. And I want to give you a number of different definitions so that you've got a, you've got a sense of that. First, this is from um, Joseph Runzo, who is, wrote a book called The Global Philosophy of Religion. He defines it this way, genuine religion is fundamentally a search for meaning beyond materialism. Materialism means the physical world. So he's saying to look for something beyond the physical world. A world religion tradition is a set of symbols and rituals, myths and stories, concepts and true claims, which a historical community believes gives ultimate meaning to life via a connection to a transcendent beyond the natural order. A transcendent means something other than us, something beyond us. It's another way of saying non-material. Okay. To a transcendent which is beyond the natural order, the physical world. John Renard in the Handy Religion Answer Book says, religion is in the broadest sense, it means adherence to a set of beliefs or teachings about the deepest and most elusive things about life's mysteries. Uh, Mark Gelman, and Thomas Hartman in their book, Religion for Dummies. I always hate that. I don't, you know, why would anybody want to admit they're a dummy? But some of those books are really good. I've used them. And Religion for Dummies, they define a religion as a belief in divine that is superhuman or spiritual being or beings and the practices, rituals, moral code, ethics that result from that belief. And then they say something, I really like this phrase, which is one of the reasons I'm using this. Beliefs give religion its mind. Here's what we believe, what we've decided on. Ritual gives religion its shape, and ethics give religion its heart. I like that. I think that's a... But you begin to see why there's more pieces to this than the simplistic definition of its belief in God. Because it does, by most people's definition, involve not only beliefs, but also ritual, practices, ethical standards, etc. Um, Merriam-Webster's Encyclopedia of World Religions defines religion as a system of communal, be uh, communal beliefs and practices 
relative to superhuman beings. A lot of the definitions of religion refer to the belief in superhuman or supernatural beings, or a being, or beings, God or gods, or angels, or demons. When, that's why there's some disagreement as to whether all cultures have had religion, is because virtually all cultures have had some belief in a spiritual or a supernatural world. Whether that was conceived of as a god or, for instance, nature spirits, which is what animism is all about. You've heard people refer to the god of the mountains and the god of the rivers and the god of the lakes. That's a very new agey kind of thing, but it is one of the most ancient of religious beliefs because it has to do with the existence of spiritual beings unlike us. And so almost all definitions of religion have something to do with the belief in a spiritual being, God, or spiritual beings, spirits, angels, demons, etc. A couple, a few more definitions. Religion, according to Peter Mandeville and Paul James, who have written on this, is a relatively bounded system of beliefs, symbols, and practices that address the nature of existence. See, they don't define it in terms of spiritual beings. Edward Burnett Tyler, who wrote in the late 1800s, defined religion as the belief in spiritual beings, and he added that this is a belief which has existed in all known societies. We are not aware of any culture ever that did, has not had some idea or belief about the supernatural. Now, that takes different... It may not have been an organized religion. It may not have had a ritual. But they still believe in something supernatural. The most ancient uh, human artifacts had to do with some sort of belief in the supernatural. And Emil Durkheim, who did a re was really significant in the history of comparative religion, defined religion as a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things. That is, things set apart and forbidden. You'll notice he doesn't say anything about spiritual beings. You get an idea about what the wide differences are in terms of understanding of this word. I believe we should think of religion as some organized collection of beliefs, cultural systems, and worldviews that relate us, humanity, to some larger sense of existence. There appears to be in all human beings some inherent sense that there is something more than us. In fact, there has never been a culture that did not believe that there was a spiritual world beyond us. There's also never been a culture that we found that doesn't have some sense that there's something wrong with us, which is one of the purposes of religion, is to help address the things that are perceived as wrong with us. Now, the very word religion comes from a Latin word, which is religionum, which means, in the Latin, a respect for what is sacred or a reverence for the gods. Now, some people, like St. Augustine, said they believed that it was more linked to the ancient words re legare. Legare means to be connected to, and re means again. So it means to reconnect, which I like. I like Augustine anyway. But I believe that the idea that we are seeking to be reconnected with something greater than ourselves is a good understanding of what religion is. Now, another interesting fact about religion in general. The concept, the sort of abstract concept of religion, despite all the disagreement about what exactly it means, did not exist prior to the 17th century. Any of the ancient words in Greek or Hebrew or in, uh, in the Islamic world in Arabic, the words that often today are translated as religion, they meant worship. It meant the act of worship, or they meant law, the things you had to obey. The sort of abstract concept of religion did not come along until after the Protestant Reformation, which was in the 16th century, and during the Age of Exploration, when Europeans had gone through the Protestant Reformation and they had to have some way to differentiate, to be able to speak inclusively about the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church and the Orthodox Churches, which had left in the 11th century, um, as what, what's one word we can use for all those? Because they've got a different sense of the law, the different sense of worship. And then when all the explorers started going out into the rest of the world and found out that all these cultures in other parts of the world also had beliefs in the supernatural, that's when we came up with a word that sort of ties all that together. And that is the word religion. In fact, the names of most of the religions we're going to be talking about, including Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Confucianism, for instance, those words did not exist until the 19th century because the people who practiced that, those beliefs, they didn't need to name it because it was their belief system. It was, it was their culture. It was a fundamental part of who they were. But when we started trying to talk about all of them at once, we needed some generic word, and so the word religion. 
In fact, until the mid-1800s, 1853 to be exact, in 1853, American warships sort of semi-conquered Japan. I won't get into all that history, but in, in subduing the Japanese in the mid-1800s, the Americans demanded that they sign treaties. And one of the treaties they made them sign said that they guaranteed freedom of religion. And the Japanese said, what does that mean? They had no word for religion. There was no Japanese word that would refer to what we call religion today. And so you get the idea that the very the abstract concept, there have always been very concrete terms and very concrete understanding of what it meant to worship or to obey the law or to honor the gods or the ancestors or whatever the beings were. But the concept of religion as an abstract was new. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of sidestep here. Um, a few of you, I know, have taken our new members class here at Lakeside Presbyterian Church, and that class is called What We Believe and Teach. And one of the things that I get into is the different perceptions about God. And I decided that while this is a little bit of a sidestep, I, I think it's valuable for us as kind of a context for religions. The different ways that people today, or even historically, have understood God. First, the one we're most familiar with is monotheism. Monotheism is mono, one, theo, God. One God, the belief in one God. The uh, dominant religions that have given us that, first Judaism, the first great monotheistic religion. We could argue that Akhenaten in Egypt was a monotheist, but he actually came along around the same time as Abraham. So he didn't really, you know, he didn't really pave any new paths. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, the three greatest monotheistic religions. Christianity and Islam are the first and second largest religions in the world today. We'll get into that. Then we have, the more ancient, is polytheism. Polytheism was a lot of the ancient Greek and Roman pantheons, but it also is represented in Hinduism and Shinto today. Uh, Hinduism, they say that there are 400 million gods in Hinduism, because Hinduism is a, is a pantheistic religion, which is the next one I want to mention. Pantheism is almost a philosophical belief, but it reflects people's belief about God. Pantheism says everything is God. You, the shirt you're wearing, the chair you're sitting in, this more, this chair, this glass of water, they all together make up God. That God is the physical universe. That uh, is common in the ancient Stoics of Greece, and it is part of the sort of new age. That's why you will hear people say, you know, I prefer to worship the God of the mountains and the trees, etc. That all of that is God. You then get panentheism, which is close, but a little different. And it's best reflected, perhaps, in the, the Native American religions. The Native Americans were talking about the spirit of the wolf as being divine, and the spirit of other things. But then they were talking about the great spirit, right, above that, who's not manifested physically. So panentheism says that all things together are divine. They're all part of God, but then there's something above the things you can see and experience. The great spirit that is also included in that. We're going to get into some of these concepts as we go along. Deism is the belief that there is a God, or perhaps it's not a personal God, it may be an evolutionary force. This is something that, with a capital E, capital F, evolutionary force. Voltaire, George Bernard Shaw, a number of other major historic figures maintained an evolutionary force created the universe. But God, according to deism, is either not personal or else he created the universe and then he went on an extended vacation. He went to Puerto Vallarta, we don't have a forwarding number, and so we don't know where he is. Uh, a lot of the Enlightenment thinkers held this. Some of the founders of the American uh, government, particularly Thomas Jefferson, was a deist, did not believe in a personal God, although he believed there was some force that created it. You then have animism, which we're going to talk about the last week. Animism is the belief that all natural phenomena have souls. This is the most primitive of all religious beliefs. It is not a world religion in the sense that it is not organized, but it is. If you've ever been to Thailand, some places in, in Asia, or even Africa, and you'll see these little spirit houses, and the spirit houses in them have fruit offerings. And have you ever been there? Have you ever seen those? They're usually beautifully carved, painted bright colors, especially in Southeast Asia. Um, those spirit houses are considered a dwelling place for the local animistic spirits, and they bring them offerings, which they very often actually eat, um, because of an attempt to try to satisfy or, or mollify these spirits, because the belief is ultimately if they don't do something to try to make them happy, then those spirits might hurt them. 
And so as beautiful, as pretty as it may seem, animism is basically a, a, a religious belief of fear. It's an effort to try to keep from being hurt by the spirits by making them happier. Um, you then have atheism. A, theos, means not God. Atheism is a belief that there is no God. And we'll get into that in the last week as well. Agnosticism is the belief that says, I don't know or I can't know about God. I'm not saying yes, I'm not saying no. It is the fence-sitting position, where we say, I'm not sure, or I don't think I can know. Now, all of these are reflected in various religious beliefs, either world religions or other kind of beliefs, but the one that I think is most common in Western culture is the one I call laziism. <laughs> It basically says, I don't think about anything, I can't be bothered about anything, where's my beer? Right? It used to be, wherever someone landed in terms of their own belief system, that it was expected that people needed to think about this stuff. They needed to make a decision about what values or ethical systems they should follow, what belief systems they would have. We don't do that anymore, and because of that, so many people, I think, go through their life never really thinking about what is it I believe. That's one of the purposes for this series of lectures. We need to make a decision about, I believe, about what we believe. And in order to understand and to do that intelligently, we need to know what the options are, if you will. So these are some of the ways people have thought about God, and still to today. But why? Why religion? I've talked about what religion is, and some of the perceptions about God, at least. But why do religions exist? Here's a quote from Pascal Boyer in the periodical Skeptical Inquirer. And Pascal Boyer is an atheist, an avowed atheist. But he says, religious practices, religious beliefs and practices are found in all human groups and go back to the very beginnings of human culture. So even people who might think it's dumb don't doubt that it has always been present. So why? What are the reasons for this? Some of the reasons that are given is to provide a set of ideas about how and why the world is put together as it is. We clearly are not in control. We don't know everything, we can't see everything, and so religion gives us some idea about how the world works so that we don't feel quite as out of control. It, it, religion may exist as a means to help people deal with problems in human life that are significant, persistent, and intolerable. Suffering, pain, oppression, how do we deal with those? Having a religious belief system gives us some point of reference that we can deal with that stuff better. Religion may be a response to the seemingly inherent sense that there is something beyond the material world. Like I say, there's never been a culture that didn't have some sense that there's something bigger than us, there's something other than us. There is something transcendent, non-material, spiritual. And so it may be a simple response to that. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes because that's important. It may be that religions exist to bind together a society or a culture. It's the thing that ties a group of people together. Or religion may exist as a means to a transcendental meaning or purpose and often a goal to aspire to in the afterlife. In other words, this can't be all there is. I need to believe that, you know, life, which is brutal, short, you know, kind of thing, is that there's something more than that. Other kinds of explanations for religion are that religion gives an explanation for whatever it is we don't understand. That it's a psychological reaction to our lives and our surroundings. Perhaps it's a way of expressing particular social needs. It's a tool of the status quo to keep some people in power and others out. That was Karl Marx's favorite. That religion was the opiate of the people. It keeps people sedated so that the people in power can stay in power. That's been one of the beliefs. Uh, religion may be considered a focus on the supernatural and sacred aspects which we inherently have a feeling of in our lives or as an evolutionary strategy for survival. Because religion, if it binds people together, that means we're all there to defend each other. Those are all, all the kinds of different beliefs. But the reason why we need to struggle with this, the reason why we need to decide what we believe and why religion exists is because if religion is completely inexplicable, if we can't really get there, which some people have proposed, that you can't really deal with it, uh, we only just put a thin layer of paint on it and say we understand it, but if we can't deal with it at all, then we fundamentally have a problem with dealing with any human culture, with any human sense of values, because religion is inherently a part of all human culture. Religion, in fact, is a universal human experience. I've already noted, and I quoted Pascal Boyer, all human cultures have had some kind of religion, whether you use the word religion or not, some sense 
of the supernatural, the spiritual, the non-material, something bigger than us. And it's taken many different forms, but we've all had something. A global survey in 2015 found that 78% of the people in the world, I'm sure they didn't ask everybody, but I guess they can can in a poll, 78% of the world's population identify themselves as religious. By comparison, 11% in this survey identified themselves as convinced atheists. We'll talk about that more when we talk about atheism. 92% of Americans, I don't mean to exclude the Canadians and others in our midst, but I only have statistics for that. 92% of all Americans say they believe in a personal God. You often couldn't tell it from the way they act, but 92% of Americans believe in a personal God. And very importantly, in 2011, the results were reported from a multi-year, three-year, Oxford-based project. It was called the Cognition, Religion, and Theology Project. And this project, which was co coordinated by Oxford University, actually incorporated 40 different studies in 40 different regions and countries around the world, and drew all of that together in one report. So it is a worldwide, three-year, Oxford University-based analysis that reported, and I quote here, religion comes naturally, in, even instinctively, to human beings. So it's not just that historically, we've never found a culture that doesn't have some sense of religious belief, but today, I mean, as of 2011, when they reported this, there was the sense in which human beings everywhere have a natural, even instinctive sense of religion. And the man who coordinated that is Dr. Roger Trigg of Oxford University, and he says this, we tend, we being all people, we tend to see purpose in the world. We see agency. We think that something is there even if we can't see it. All this tends to build up a religious way of thinking. The University, uh, National University of Singapore, in a study that they did, concluded this. Religious beliefs and cultural norms form one of the most fundamental motivations of all human life influencing, either directly or indirectly, the vast majority of our thoughts and actions, and people often express their deepest values in forms of religious symbolic behavior. Atheists for some time have said, that, I mean, non-believers, and there's a difference in atheists and anti-theists. A lot of the new atheists today, um, the Dawkinses and Dennets, etc., they're not just atheists, they're anti-theists. They're trying to prevent anybody else from believing. I'm not, I'm not making that up. I mean, I'm not trying to misquote them. We'll talk about that a little bit. And yet, they are always saying that religion is because people were, were smart back then. And so today, we're getting away from religion, and eventually we'll completely see that we don't need it anymore because science and modern culture and everything else will meet that need. Well, all of the studies today are saying that's not happening. Voltaire predicted that... Sometime, he thought initially within his lifetime, that Christianity would be gone. It is a fact that Voltaire's study in France later on became a Bible printing workshop. And all of the predictions of the inevitable demise of religious belief have not come to fruition. It is true there are more people checking the nun box. There are more people who are identifying themselves as atheists, but from a percentage point of view, Religious faith is growing faster than that is overall, in terms of numbers of people. So, human beings cannot get away from this idea that there is something bigger than us, other than us, something spiritual. History, history says that. But, even more perhaps important is today, there is a very strong indication that human beings are actually hardwired to believe, to have faith to have religious beliefs. I say hardwired because what I mean by that is that our brains are designed to have religious belief. In fact, there's a new field of study called neurotheology. Neurotheology is a, a branch of brain research that studies the relationship between the brain and religious experience. The primary advocate for that is a man named Dr. Andrew Newberg. He's a neuroscientist and he's the author of a book called Why We Believe What We Believe. And he sort of pioneered the idea of neurotheology. What he did was, he did extensive studies of Tibetan monks, of Catholic Franciscan nuns, and Pentecostal Christians while they were speaking in tongues, glossolalia, and demonstrated that religious experiences of all kinds, be they meditation, prayer, or expression of, of miraculous tongues, all stimulate multiple areas
areas of the brain in a way that very few other things do. It used to be believed that the religious experience was only part of the temporal lobes, which are the parts of our brains on the side that process sensory input into meaning and into emotions. The emotional part, you know, of taking in experiences and deciding what did that mean for us. But the work of the neurotheologists have now identified that the temporal lobes are affected, but also the frontal lobe, which is the area of our brain right behind our foreheads, which helps us focus our attention. That, that people in prayer and people in meditation have a, a greatly increased uh, frontal focus of concentration. That the parietal lobe, which is near the backs of the sort of uh, top and back of our brain, is involved in, in the parietal lobe is involved in the feeling of becoming part of something greater than ourselves. The idea that I felt one with the universe, if you will particularly with some of the monks as they entered states of meditation, one of the things that often is described is they have, they have a sense of no longer just being themselves, of being sort of bigger than themselves. Well, the parietal lobe, one of the things it does is it gives us our sense of dimensionality, of how far away I am from that pulpit or how far it is to the bathroom or whatever. And the, the activity in the parietal lobe during meditation literally means people are losing this ability, this, three-dimensional uh, sensory perception in a way that could be described as saying I no longer was just me, it was something bigger than me. I no longer had a sense of relationship with the physical world. Also the limbic system, which is deep in the center of the brain, which regulates emotions, is responsible for feelings of awe and joy. All of these have been demonstrated as being actively part of the religious experience, be it meditation, prayer, speaking in tongues, or other kinds of religious experience. Dr. Andrew Newberg says this about his research. When we think of religious and spiritual beliefs and practices, we see a tremendous similarity across those practices and across traditions. All of those parts of the brain are involved in spiritual activities. Now, it's very interesting that that fact, which is now accepted as a fact, because the research is very clear, is interpreted by both sincere believers in the people of faith and atheists as being proof of their side. Because those who are the atheists say, well this just proves that uh, religious feeling, religious sense, the feeling of the, of the spiritual, is nothing more than a chemical reaction in the brain. Whereas the believers, and I probably don't need to tell you this is where I come down, would say instead that this demonstrates the fact that if God desires us to seek Him, to find Him, to have faith in Him, that God actually created our brains in such a way that we are sensitive, we are sensitized to, we are inclined to believe in God, that our brains are actually made that way for a reason. So we have a very different sort of interpretation in terms of what does that mean that human beings are hardwired for happiness. Now again, the presumption had always been that science would be able to answer all the questions about the natural world, that God would no longer be necessary, and yet we now find that the human brain is in some way preconditioned, hardwired for spiritual experiences, to seek after God. Um, and again, the, the manifestations of that are huge. Now, that, that doesn't mean, and the, the people involved in neurotheology are not claiming that it proves the existence of God. All they're saying is there is something about us something in our brains that incline us in that direction. And that they believe that is the reason why down through history there has been so much of a spiritual manifestation in the culture of all human societies. Now, Newberg, again, Andrew Newberg, the, the sort of founder of neurotheology, suggests that these brain scans provide proof that our brains are built to believe in God and in the supernatural. And he says, I quote, there may be universal features of the human mind that actually make it easier for us to believe in a higher power. I think that's very powerful. And again, the atheist would say, well that just demonstrates the fact that there is no spiritual world, there is nothing beyond the physical world, it's just chemical reactions in the brain. Which is also how they describe love. Love is just a chemical reaction. Trust, faith, loyalty, all those things that are not necessarily cognitive, they say still are just chemical reactions. I tend not to believe that. 
Another study which was done, this was done by the London School of Economics and the Erasmus University Medical Center in the Netherlands, of a number of different groups, particularly um, adults and older people throughout Europe. They wanted to figure out the secret to sustained happiness and what that had to do with involvement culturally, socially. And so they identified four categories of social activities. Those categories were volunteering to do uh, volunteering or doing charitable work. Secondly, uh, taking educational or training courses. Third, participating in political or community organizations. And fourth, participating in religious organizations. So those four, either volunteering or doing charitable work, taking educational or training courses, participating in political or community organizations, or participating in religious organizations. The data was conclusive that participation in religious organizations is the, and I quote here, the only social activity associated with sustained happiness. Go to church. <laughs> in fact, they identified that some participation, particularly in social, um, political, or community organizations, actually made people less happy, perhaps because of the stress they felt. But again, the data from this study from the London School of Economics at Erasmus University Medical Center is conclusive that participation in religious activities is the only social category they could identify, that is, communal social activity, that created greater happiness in people. Why is that? What is the possible reason for that? Does it perhaps tie back to the idea that our brains are actually designed for spiritual activities, and then we at least are approaching that when we're involved in religious activities in a way that we're not when we're involved in political activities, or education, or even volunteer work. A lot more work is being done on this all, of the, all the time, but all of it so far, even though people come up with different explanations for why they think this is true, all of it points back to the explanation for why human culture has always had some kind of religious beliefs is because we're made that way. There is something in us. Now, that religious belief gets manifest, historically manifested in many different ways, through polytheism, which still exists today in Hinduism and Shinto and some others, through um, some, I'll, I'll give this away, I mentioned earlier, some people would argue that Buddhism is not a religion, because Buddhism does not advocate a belief in God. There is no God in the Buddhist belief system. Um, and so, if you don't have a divine being, are you a religion? Again, there's a question mark there. Some are purely ethical systems. When you get into Confucianism, for instance, it is primarily Confucius. Um, he advocated a way of life that he felt would make people happy, that had to do with accepting your place and accepting your responsibilities and performing them to the best of your ability that you would find satisfaction in that. It, too, is questionable in terms of defining it as a religion. So, but, but there is a sense in which this takes on a higher, a religious kind of overtone, even though it may simply be an ethical system. So human beings throughout history have always and everywhere believed in the divine, have believed in the supernatural. And we're going to be studying the various religions and how they manifested that, how they've expressed that, how they have felt that is to be lived out. Again, the vast majority of people in the world today are still religious, even though those who are against religious belief might try to convince you otherwise. We'll talk about specific numbers later on. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes. I'm going to open it up to questions. Uh, if I didn't raise any questions, then I didn't do my job. What questions do you have? Yes, please. Most of these religions believe in an afterlife? Heaven? Do most of these religions believe in an afterlife? That really varies. A number of them, for instance, would, would maintain the belief in transmigration of the soul, which we call reincarnation. That means that there is an afterlife, but it's like this life. You come back. A friend of mine, a roommate of mine, once described it. He said, I finally figured out this reincarnation thing. If you're really good, you get to come back as a person. If you're really bad, you come back as a frog. And if you're really, really good, you don't have to come back at all. That is nirvana. People, you hear the word nirvana. Nirvana literally means nothingness. The idea that the best you can achieve is not to exist anymore. And, and it varies. Buddhism does not have a, a perception of the afterlife. It has to do with how you live best now, the middle path. 
of, of neither asceticism, denying yourself, or of luxury and greed, uh, trying to satisfy all your desires, but the middle path. Um, various religions have different approaches. A lot of them do have a belief in the afterlife of some sort, but not all of them. Again, and it's, it's usually, that's linked to, do the religious systems have a belief in spiritual or supernatural beings or not? Okay. And where do we go with that in terms of what do we become? Some religions believe we become one of those when we die, a supernatural spiritual being, even a divine being. We'll get into that a little bit. Other questions? Yes? If 78% of uh, U.S. citizens, and I presume much Canadians also, <clears throat> define themselves as being religious. So oh, that's 78% globally. Well, that was globally. Yeah. What percentage of those people would actually practice their religion by attending church? Oh boy, now you left preaching God a medley. <laughs> How many people actually practice them? I just remember when it was de Raguerre or, or Ronald right. to go to church on Sunday and, and now it seems like it's watch TV on Sunday morning and right. Friday. Yeah, well, it's, it's a good question. How, how many people practice it? Um, and what does it mean to practice it? I, from, I grew up in Tennessee, or my parents were from Tennessee. I, I spent most of my early life there. And everybody in Tennessee is a Christian. A lot of them don't go to church. And yet, they, and that was true with my parents, who both became believers before their death. But, you know, my mother would say things like, I know I'm as good as those people who are in that church every time the doors open. Because she thought it meant being good. Which is not what Christianity is all about. I'll talk about that. But, it, in fact, I preached a sermon recently called Take the Narrow Way. And I'm doing a series called If You Love Me, Obey My Commands, Jesus. And 88% of Americans identify themselves as Christian. Do we see it? Are they living that out? I mean... 78% uh, of the global population, 92% identify a per that they believe in a personal God in the United States. 88% of those people, the vast majority, say that they identify themselves, self-identify as Christian. Um, the is, issue, that, is that checking off the box? Exactly. exactly. It's or is say, it actually doing something about it? When I say self-identify, that means they check that box. Yeah. Okay. Now, whether the issue of what is required in order for that to really mean anything differs. Obviously, as an as a evangelical Christian minister, I have a very different idea than my mother did when she said, well, I'm just as good as those people. Right? So there's a wide range of difference in that. When we, when we talk about adherence to a religious belief, in almost every case we are, we are saying to self-identify. Now, it's a fact that in most of the rest of the world, that is not Western world, um, U.S., Canada, uh, Western Europe, those people who would align themselves as being a member of a religion usually practice it. Somebody who says that they're part of Islam will almost invariably participate in the prayers. Now, they may not do it the five times a day that's called for because Islam allows you to, to make up prayers. If you're busy during that time, if you have to work or you're traveling or whatever, you can do it later. But they will, there are certain, um, many of the religions, unlike Christianity, um, most of the religions are, ortho, are about orthopraxy, in other words, doing the right thing, as opposed to orthodoxy, which is about believing the right thing. Unfortunately, Christianity, and some other religions, but Christianity especially, is so much about believing the right thing, that's pretty hard to measure. It's pretty hard to identify with what somebody believes, even based on how they act. You know, you may call something as an exception. You know, how can you say you believe that when you, you're doing this? But it's much more difficult than orthopraxy. In Islam, there are the five, five major principles of Islam, and you can see if somebody's following those or not. It's harder with Christianity and some of the other belief systems. So, we'll get into that a little bit. Yes, Catherine. Would you also say that religion might have some, uh, try to answer how we happen to be, how we were right. created as well? Right. This, you know, where did we come from? Where did we come from? Right? And where did the universe come from? Um, one of the things that's commonly said about the ancient creation myths, and for instance, the book of Genesis, Genesis 1, versus the Enuma Elish and the you know, various other, the ancient epics from um, Mesopotamia, the Sumerian, Babylonian epics, they are as old or even older than Genesis. And I have heard people say, well, they're all basically the same. They all seem, they say basically the same thing. Actually, they don't. There are some fundamental differences. Almost every other ancient creation epic, for instance, starts out by trying to explain where the gods came from. 
How did the gods come to be? The Jewish epic of creation, which is Genesis 1, we have it in our Bibles, starts out with the assumption that God existed. It has always existed. In the beginning, God created. There is no effort to explain where he came from. Every other ancient tradition also says that creation occurred in the midst of and through chaos, and that there was a huge war going on, that out of that war, the gods were able to create. The Jewish um, creation story simply says that God said, let there be light, and there was light. God only had to speak the word. There was no struggle. There was no chaos in that regard. I mean, there was chaos of the waters, but God quickly put it all in order. So there are fundamental differences. There are many attempts to what you're saying to try to explain where did it all come from. And that is sort of where many religions start. They have some sort of creation sense or creation myth or creation story. But those differ pretty widely even though most people, often when people say things like, well, they're all basically the same, if you ask a few questions, you can find out they've never actually read them. They simply had somebody tell them that, and they've accepted it. Okay. Um, pe what people say about Islam, for instance, I, I, um, I had a sense that a lot of people had these ideas about Islam and about the Quran that weren't true, and so I have read it. I've read the Quran. And that gives me a perspective that's different from what a lot of the talk I hear people say. And we'll talk about that. Other questions? Yes? Um, where, where do people get into our basic monotheism? Like, yeah, except that other religions that are monotheistic are bad, like, and it's not a problem. Okay. Um, the, question, the question was where do people who are monotheistic, who believe in a God, but uh, are willing to accept that other monotheistic religions can also be correct. Where do they sort of fit in that? Look at it. Let me, let me speak to that. I said earlier that there's a fundamental philosophical reason why I don't think everybody can be right. Okay? Uh, and it's, it's actually a very new idea that different people who say very different things can all be right. You know, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe it with your whole heart. First, we have to. We live in a pluralistic world, which means everyone does have a right, and I would defend the right of everyone to believe what they want, as long as they don't damage somebody else. I would absolutely fight for that, whether I agree with their beliefs or not. But saying that somebody has a right to believe what they want is not the same as saying you agree with them, or that you believe the same thing they do. That's not the same thing. And let me tell you why I don't think everyone can be right. I, I would maintain that Jesus Christ was the Son of God as a Christian. That he was the co-eternal son who came to earth as a human being, died, was resurrected, and uh, ascended, and is coming again. A Jewish person or an uh, Islamic person, both of them monotheists, would say, no, that's not true. They would disagree with me. Are we both right? Can we both be right? Well, in philosophy, some of you have heard me talk about this, because this, this is a theme I get to a lot in classes that I teach. Um, in rational thought, more than just philosophy, in rational thought, the basic principles of logic, there are three basic fundamental laws of logic. They're so important, they're sometimes called the laws of thought, because without them, we can't have any sort of rational, reasonable, organized thinking. Those three laws are the law of identity, the law of the excluded middle, and the law of non-contradiction. The law of non-contradiction is actually second, but that's the one I want to mention. The law of identity says something is what it is. Duh. But without that, you know, you, things get very confused. The law of the excluded middle says something either is or it is not. There isn't an in-between state. It either is or it isn't. The law of non-contradiction, the important one, says something cannot be both true and not true at the same time and in the same way. Of course, technically something cannot both be and not be at the same time and in the same way. What that means is, from the basic principle of rationality, if I say that Jesus was the Son of God, and my Muslim brother says he is not, we both have a right to say it, but we can't both be right. There's a fundamental contradiction rationally there. And it, you know, the, the basic laws of thought say that as much as we have a right to believe what we want, and to, and to profess what we believe, and to, you know, to evangelize in Islam or, Judaism or anything else, we can't both be right at some point, unless you are prepared to forego all rationality. Some Eastern religions do just that. Islam doesn't. Judaism doesn't. Christianity doesn't. So if you're talking about the monotheistic religions, they all would maintain a basic belief in rationality. And the basic sense of rationality is that either the Muslim is right, or 
the Jew is right or I am right. We can't all three be right. Does that make sense? You may not agree with it, but does it at least make sense? This is why from a philosophical point of view, philosophical theology is really my primary field, why I don't believe it's possible for us to say everybody is equally right, that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe it with your whole heart. Everyone has a right to believe what they want. But we need to decide what do we believe because we can't just believe everything. We can't just have a mashup of all beliefs and think that's, that makes sense because it doesn't. Now, not everybody makes sense. And that's okay too. <laughs> but we need to be clear about that. Other questions or comments? Yes? Yes, well, this is a hard one. Um, I was going to a, a Episcopal church and I moved and I went to a Bible study. And it was. Um, I didn't realize it was born again Christian, nobody, no labels, just a bunch of nice, really nice people. Okay. And they said there was this lady, she's very powerful, they respected her. And they asked me if I was born, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I said, well, yes, I believe so. Yeah. Okay, so they joined hands and invited me to come, and I thought it was just a prayer. Okay. <laughs> okay. And everyone spoke in tongues. Myself. Okay. And I can tell you that this was real. I was so naive. I right. had no idea what was happening to me. Okay. <laughs> so the temporal looks and all of that. But I went back to my church um, just a couple hours away. And he said, oh, stay away from that. That's I said that tongues is in the Bible. It is. He said, well, it's not now. Yet that's the past. And right. then he goes, they're a cult. I'm wow. going, they're really nice people. They were going by the Bible. I didn't see anything cult-like about them at all, except for the fact that I spoke in tongues, and I had no control over it. Okay. Now, he made me feel so guilty. I couldn't even tell a group of people that I spoke in tongues. Because I was guilt-ridden. Oh, that's bad. You're blowing it to a cult. Okay. So anyway, what's your thought on it? Well, in case you, you couldn't hear, um, she participated in a Bible study, and it was a charismatic Bible study of some kind, and they spoke in tongues, and she experienced speaking in tongues, called glossolalia, by the way, that's the technical word for it, um, and then went back to her priest minister, who said, no, that's a cult, that's not real, etc. Well, to say it's not real is to deny the scripture. Now, we, our church is not a charismatic church in the sense that we don't, we do believe all people who accept Jesus Christ have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, Paul said, that all are given gifts for the common good, and yet those gifts differ. The gifts of uh, hospitality, of service, the gifts of uh, prophecy, which actually means not telling the future, but rather putting forth God's Word, which is preaching, the gifts of teaching, administration, etc. All of those are gifts of the Spirit. Paul also includes, and Paul is our source for this in the Bible, speaking in tongues, uh, interpreting of tongues, performing of miracles. I had, a, I had a New Testament professor in seminary who said the same thing as your priest, and that is, those things were for then, they're not for now. Well, Paul spends a lot of his effort in the New Testament trying to teach the churches that existed, the churches that were continued long after the apostles were all dead, about the gifts of the Spirit. And if he was doing that, it doesn't make sense to me that all of the gifts were going to go away after the apostles. And so... I disagree with your priest. Um, I think there's there's all, I believe, the gifts of the Spirit from a Christian perspective. We're getting into denominational differences now, but uh, we don't practice those more miraculous gifts here in terms of speaking in tongues and things. But I can't look at Scripture and say that, that those are not valid because it says they are. Paul talks about them a great deal. He does say, he said, I would, I would want all of you to speak in tongues as I do. But then he says that in the church, in the services, it's better to speak five words somebody can understand than 10,000 that nobody can understand. So he's got, he's, he qualifies it very carefully, and he's very sensible about it. But to say that that's not scriptural, that that's not Christian, simply is not accurate. Um, okay. And this, it's because, again, we're getting into a particular Christian thing here. Um, we take our holy writings in, in virtually all, say virtually, probably all, I can't think of any exceptions, virtually all of the major religions have some sort of written holy book or writings. You know, the Vedas, um, the Upanishads in, in Hinduism, um, you know, 
all, virtually all of them have some sort of sacred writings, and ours is the Bible. And so if we hold to that faith, then that's our source. Okay. One more question. Yes? This tends to speak to what she experienced, and it also speaks to the neurobiological and the brain research. Have we done or read much on the DMT molecule that our pineal glands produce? Um, is that the cross-shaped molecule? I don't know the shape of it. Okay. It's called the, the spirit, God spirit molecule, right. Right. which is partially responsible for the flow. Right. The oxycontin is... is so it's DMT. Yes. Right. It's called the spirit molecule, and it's produced by the endolimic system. Right. And it's what allows us to experience. It's very quick and very rapid, but much research has been written that it is often the trigger for a sad state, Rosalia. Right. I, exactly. When we talk about the various parts of the brain that are stimulated by religious experience, in the case of the limbic system, stimulated means that one of the things they do is they produce various chemicals, and the, um, the God molecule from the limbic system is one of those. So, yes. Thank you all very much for being here today. Next week, we will get into the details of some of the world religions when we talk about um, the, the, the particulars of... Um, I didn't put this up here. World religions, basically we're talking about those faiths which have historically been transcultural and international, not the, you know, the sort of localized ethnic religions and not some of the sort of new religious movements kinds of things. So next week we're going to start with our world religion focus, which is with Hinduism. And for those of you who like, um, I'm not gonna, I didn't want to get into this, I decided it was too, too much to you. Um, but some of these you've seen before. This is the way religions are spread around the world today. I'll leave that up there if anybody wants to look at the map. The dark blue is Catholicism, the light blue is Protestantism, the sort of gray throughout all of you know, Russia, the, ancient, the, the old Soviet Union, is Orthodoxy, which reaches down into Eastern Europe. Uh, the dark red is Sunni Islam, the lighter red is the Shia Islam, and there's very interesting little uh, You'll notice a different color right here if you look at it, which is Oman. Oman has its own version of Islam called Ibadism, or the Ibadi faith. Um, and then you get some various other kinds of things. I'll leave that up in case anybody wants to look at it. Please help yourself to a cup of coffee, a cookie, and um, we'll continue talking if you have any questions. Please come see me.